Good morning, family. I almost feel like I should just say, hey, let's stand, let's pray, and let's go home. I'm telling you, there's something about being not just in the presence of God, but being in the presence of God while being together in the presence of God's people. That is unmatched to any other thing you can experience in this world. I believe, or even beyond. Revelation chapter 4 paints this picture of every tribe, every nation, and every tongue gathered around the throne with the angels and the elders and the four living creatures giving honor and glory to the God of gods and to the King of kings. Um, then I had this like big thing planned how I was going to do this intro and, and then God comes in and goes, this man just king of glory. Fill this place. Because at the end of the day, not even heaven is heaven if God's not there. Amen? If you're visiting with us this morning or you're watching online, if you're watching online, you just should have been here. Whatever God is doing in your home, man, God bless you. But man, do you all feel faith in this room right now? Do you sense something is different? You're visiting... Uh, this morning here in the house, welcome. You may be kind of standing around and going, what is this? What, what? Then it's the presence of God. And it's a good thing. Amen? Amen. We're in the series, God Can. And uh, in the first week, we, we talked about the fact that God can resurrect. God can bring back to life things that are dead. How many of you are glad for that? And last week, Pastor Justin, he talked with us about the names of God, because how many of you know that the names of God represent God's character? It's not just what we call him, it's who he is. This week, I wanted to give you a third thing, and it's this. God can be trusted. And that seems like a duh kind of moment, right? Duh, of course God can be trusted. But am I the only one that knows how to say that with a lot of confidence until I'm in the thick. Until it's your relationship that's messed up. I'm good until the doctor gives me that report, right? And the question is, can God be trusted? You know, this weekend we had a great, uh, my family and I, we got to, some of us, we got to go to Puerto Rico two weeks ago. My Spanish has not gotten any better. Um, for those of you that are interested, um, but we, we had just such a wonderful time um, being there with, with family, and, and uh, the coolest thing about this vacation is that my son paid for the whole vacation, so oh, yeah. there's, there's only something better than a vacation, it's a free vacation, right? And, um, and it was just, it was a tremendous thing, you know, and, and so we came home, we had a short week, um, I had a, a whole lot planned, going to hit the ground running, uh, but, you know... Um, by the way, I prayed for you guys the whole time I was gone that the hurricane wouldn't hit you. And I overcame my own guilt as we were sitting there in the calm breezes and you guys were under threat. But God is good. God is faithful. Um, but uh, we got home and, and came in and said, hey, I'm going to have a great week. We're going to jump in and hit the ball, hit the ground running on Tuesday. And um, how many of you know the best way to make God laugh? Tell me plans. By Wednesday, everything that I had planned was out the window, courtesy of a flat tire, um, an actual flat tire that pushed my entire day four hours um, in, in arrears. Um, but it was still a great week. And, you know, I, I'm a sports person. I enjoyed uh, the U.S. Open this week, got to watch uh, Ben Shelton, uh, homegrown Gainesville boy doing his thing over at the U.S. Open Tennis Center. Um, uh, this week got to watch one of my country women in Jamaica almost break the 200 meter, uh, record. She's like this close and really inching in on it. But one of the biggest highlights for this weekend was this Saturday, um, my, my wife and I sat hunkered around a little telephone, uh, as we watched 
the National Down Syndrome Society doing a uh, uh, a big uh, thing where they were listing all of these different families, and one of the pictures that showed up in Times Square. was my Gabby. And, um, you know, we're, my wife said, could you ever imagine anyone in our family? I said, not other than being on a wanted poster, no. <laughs> and, uh, but there she was in the midst of Times Square. And I, I show you this and I tell you about what happened with my son, not just, not to boast, not to, to brag, because every time I see something like this, it is a reminder to me of God's faithfulness. Because... 27, 28 years ago, we could not have imagined this because what we were simply hoping for was that she'd even be alive, that she'd even be born, you know? And at that moment, all of this was just a hope because how many of you know we only hope for things we don't have yet, right? Husbands, there was a time when your wife hoped that you would pop the question. That is not a hope for her anymore. Sorry to break the news to you, right? Because no one hopes for what they already have, correct? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. We, we jumped in here um, in the last series, but the verse says this, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. And so how many of you have something that you're hoping for this morning? And even if that hope seems dim, even if that hope seems in the moment lost, we can hold on to hope because God can be trusted. I love what uh, the NIV says of this same verse. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess For he who promised is faithful. He who promised is faithful. I remember as a kid growing up, I used to, I was very trusting. Um, And and if somebody said something to me, I just assumed that they were telling the truth. And my mom used to say, honey, promise is a comfort to a fool. Anybody else ever experienced that? Hey, I promise I'll get you back next week. There's, what y'all don't know, I'm actually a billionaire. True story. Because when I was in the seventh grade, I loaned this kid a lunch ticket. The 55 cent lunch ticket. And he promised me that every day that he didn't give me that 55 cents, that it would double. I'm a billionaire. Still waiting to collect. Because a promise is only as good as the one who makes the promise. Right? This seventh grader, he he lacked a couple of things. And some of you might say integrity. I think he had every intention on paying me back. I I don't think he was dishonest. I am a pretty decent judge of character. and, And he wasn't being dishonest. But there are a lot of factors that go into this idea of trust. We talk about faith in Scripture. How many of you, you know, faith is kind of one of those elusive things, isn't it? Faith. You got to have faith. Everybody tells you, you got to have faith. You got to have faith. They even wrote, George Michael wrote a song about it. Got to have faith. All right? It's just kind of one of these things we throw out at people. But let me throw this out to you because we've kind of equated this thing of faith with just believing. And so we, and we've created an entire industry around believing as if believing was all it takes. And if I can believe something strong enough that it just makes it true, all right? How many of you have found out the hard way that that ain't true? Some of you are going, oh, I don't know. I'm, I'm still, I'm in the moment, still believing. All right. So let me give you an example. No matter how much you believe that gravity doesn't exist, all right? Go ahead and break that law. And you will come face to face with the full effect of the law of gravity. As a friend once said to me, falling never hurt anybody. That sudden stop at the end that gets us every 
single time. Real biblical faith is actually based in something. Hebrews chapter 11, and if you guys have been in church any amount of time, you've heard it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. What does that mean? I don't know. The reality is, uh, there's another version that says faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's certainty in things that are unseen. You may have heard the term, sometimes you've got to step out in blind faith. How many of you have ever heard that statement? Let me, let me just correct the record. That's not a thing. It's not a thing, including with God. Because faith actually sees. Faith actually understands. Faith actually lays hold of things. Go back and read Hebrews chapter 11, the whole chapter. Um, in, in, your, in your private time, in your quiet time. One of the things that it doesn't say in there is by faith we believe. It says by faith we understand. By faith we subdue. By faith we, we, we um, obey. By faith. And so there's something that has to undergird that faith. And that word is trust. But how many of you know that trust is dependent on a few things? Isn't it? Yes? There are three elements that I believe must be in place before true trust can exist. And I want to quickly talk about those things because I, I believe that there's something in here that can help us. How many of you want to trust God more? All right, so these four right here want to really trust God. How many of you want to really learn to trust God more? All right, because this is, this is, this is, this is the uh, deal. Um, there's three things that have to be in place. The, the, the three of them are ability, integrity, and benevolence. If I told you that my son is going to take you, he's going to drive you from here down to Walmart at rush hour, he's never had a ticket, he's never, um, never had a car accident, Never, how many of you would trust that he could get you there? John says, nope, because he knows my kids. He knows the driving record. <laughs> what if I added, oh, by the way, he's four? It kind of changes, the, the, changes the, the equation a little bit, doesn't it? Why? Because while he may have a lot of integrity and may have your best interest at heart, he don't have the ability to get you there. Or you may have somebody that, that is in your life. How many, how many of you have that one friend that you love him? I mean, he's just awesome. I mean, you guys do a lot of stuff together. You hang out, man. You guys, I mean, you laugh every time you're with him, but you wouldn't trust him farther than you could throw him. Right? If you can't think of that person, you may be the, <laughs> you may be the one, right? Um, the reality is, is these things have to be in place. The first one we talked about is ability. So when we talk about trusting God, the question comes up of God's ability. There's another slide that's hidden in here somewhere, but I don't know where it is. Um, Romans chapter 1 verse 20 says this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. All we have to do to take a look at God's ability is just take a look at the world around us. You don't even have to be a Christian to get this part, all right? This is just something, as you begin to look at the world around you, I'm going the wrong way, look at that. It says, so that people are without excuse. Job, how many of you guys know Job? I heard somebody make the statement the other, the other day, they said that... Um, you know that God is proud of you when there's blessing going on in your life. Job would disagree. Sometimes God wants to brag on you, and it's, it gets a little harder. But Job said this, talking about the ability of God. While he's in the midst of the struggle, by the way, he says he spreads out the northern skies over empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. Have you ever considered a cloud? 
They say that a cumulus cloud, not a storm cloud, a cumulus cloud weighs about 1.1 million pounds. A storm cloud can weigh up to 2.4 billion pounds. Think about that the next time you walk out without an umbrella. (laughs) How about that, right? You know, for years, when scientists looked at the cosmos, we, we all know that the, everything revolves around the sun. But scientists, not too long ago, figured out that not only does everything revolve around the sun, but the sun itself is revolving around the galaxy. And that the sun itself is moving through space at about 450,000 miles an hour, carrying the planets in its wake. This incredible vortex that's moving through. Scientists spent untold millions of dollars to try to understand the universe. They built a telescope, threw it out in space, and looked through it to see what they could see. Only to see someone looking back at them. This is called the God's Eye Nebula. Can you imagine saying, hey, let's see what we can see and see that staring back at you? And you're going to look at me and say, there's no God. God is able. God is full of ability. God is full of power. Job goes on to say that God hangs the earth on nothing. And then and and he finishes by saying, but this is just the outer fringes of his power. How small a whisper we ever hear of God. And so when we talk about trusting God, is he able? Is he able? Because if he can keep this thing rolling, you woke up this morning, you looked, the sun was in the sky. You didn't even open your eyes and go, oh man, I really hope the sun comes up this morning. You just know it because God is able to sustain these things. And if he's able to sustain them, he is able to sustain you and I. Amen? There it is. This, this is, the, uh, this is the, the uh, intersection. Ability, integrity, benevolence. So we know that God is able. The second thing we want to know is integrity. Does God have integrity? Integrity is defined as the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and moral uprightness. I want to submit to you that this is not the type of integrity that we're talking about. Because as I said before, you all have that friend that is all of those things. They're honest, they have strong moral principles, moral uprightness, but you still wouldn't necessarily trust them with certain things. Correct? So let me give you a different definition of integrity. The ability of a person or thing to operate at optimal level under the pressure of a load, including the weight of the asset itself. The asset needs to sustain without drastically breaking and or deforming while still being able to perform its intended use. What do I mean by that? Indulge me for a second. Everyone stand. Every one of you that are able, please stand. Go ahead and get a good stretch. It's a good day to be alive. All right, go ahead and have a seat. And just for fun, go ahead and stand again. Come on, indulge me. All right, this is fun for me. We're doing squats. You got it. Have a seat. Yeah, I'm sure. So camera, the camera people just went nuts right now because I just left the stage. Let me show you something that I observed because I was watching all of you. I asked you all to sit down. Not a single one in this room went. Why? 
The chair, trust is a good thing, but the chair has integrity. Every time you've done this motion, it was there. A new young girl in the eighth grade that one time she sat down and that chair did not hold. Middle schoolers are cruel, y'all. <laughs> Middle schoolers are mean. But she sat down and those two back legs went boom, shot across the room. Do you think she had the same level of confidence the next time she went to sit in the chair? Every single one of us knows that one person at work that we don't even have to think about. Because we know that whatever's going on, they're going to be there. They're going to get it done. That's what we mean when we say integrity. The biblical word for that is faithful. Faithfulness. And I want you to, to know that God is faithful. But it is important that we remember God's faithfulness. This is why the stories that we tell matter. Listen to this, Joel chapter one, Joel, the the book of Joel, Joel is getting ready to lay out this incredible prophecy, this incredible story of God restoring a nation that is broken, a nation that is, that is, um, under judgment, a nation that has, that has felt abandoned by God. And then Joel comes on and he says, the word of the Lord came to Joel, son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your day or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. One of the gifts that, you know, you take the spiritual gift inventories and one of the gifts that that I'm traditionally high in is the gift of faith. Um, But I want you to know something, that the reason why I have the faith that I have today is not because I prayed more, not because I fasted more, not because I got in the Bible more. One of the reasons why the faith that I have is where it is, is because I was raised in a home where my parents shared with me, not just the Bible, but the stories of how God had performed in their lives. As a little child, I would hear, you know, my, my father, who's, who's here this morning, grew up in, in abject poverty. Um, you know, my, my grandfather left when they were still very young, and he was raised by a single mom who had nothing more than an eighth grade education, and literally existed for many years on the benevolence of others. But one of the stories my dad would tell me is that they, there were days when they didn't know that they would have any food. But in the yard was this one mango tree that always had mangoes on it, even when it wasn't mango season. And so now imagine me hearing that as a child. What am I learning? God provides. God provides. When I watched how God, tell the stories of of how God healed my mom, um, the stories of how God provided for them, even while I was a teenager, watching God move. Parents, it is not enough to just drop your kids in children's church. They need to hear the stories of what God is doing in their home. Share them with them. Psalm 145 says, One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. I love the Psalm 136 because it talks about um, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And David begins by talking about the history of God's faithfulness begins at creation. He begins going through how God created all of these things. Then he goes through how God delivered his people, Israel. But then he talks about how God led them through the wilderness and he continues right into his day. So let me ask you a question. What are the stories of God's faithfulness in your life? Remember, write them down, share them with your children Share them with your grandchildren. Share them with, if, you're, if, if you've got them, your great-grandchildren. Parents, share them with your children. We overcome, the Bible says, by the blood of the Lamb and by the, the word of our testimony. You want to see faith arise in your children? 
Tell them the stories about what God's doing right there in their home. Remember them. See them. It's very, very important. So we talked about God's ability. We talked about God's integrity. And we talked about integrity being, I know he's going to be there. All right. The third one that I want to hit on, and we're going to, this is, this is where I really want to land this. It's on God's benevolence. Because I think that this is where many of us struggle. We all know God is good. We wrote songs about it, right? God is good. And all the time. So we got the right answers for this. Benevolence means a disposition to do good. But I want to submit to you that if there's an area in your life that the enemy wants to attack, it's on this question right here. The enemy doesn't do anything new. There's no new deception under the sun. He's not really that creative. God is the creator. So the enemy doesn't really create. He just distorts. I want you to go with me back to Genesis chapter 3. Because what, what, what you see happening here in Genesis chapter 3, I believe, is what the same tools that get used in our lives to undermine these three pillars of trust. We know that God can. We know that, he, we know that he's faithful. But then comes this. It says, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, did God say that? So he's just kind of exaggerated. Did he say you couldn't eat any tree? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God did say we must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you'll die. Did God say don't touch the tree? All right, there's a little bit of confusion coming in. He said, did you say any tree? He said, no, we, just not the one in the middle of the garden. How many trees were there in the middle of the garden? For you little Bible scholars, there were two trees in the middle. But for some reason at this moment, she can only remember one tree. And here's where the problem comes in. He says, you won't certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Is being like God a bad thing? It's not a trick question. Is being God, like God, a bad thing? Ephesians chapter 5 verse 1 says, be imitators of God as dear children. Is it bad that their eyes should be opened? Is it bad that they should know the difference between good and evil? So what was wrong with eating from the fruit? Why did God say don't do it? Because you'll die. Right? God's primary concern is for your well-being, not for your enjoyment. How many of you have a stove in your house? How many of you, when you had young children, you said, don't touch that, even when it's off? Why? Is stoves bad? Stoves are evil. Got to be, right? No. But they went and touched it, some of them, anyways. The reality is, is what the enemy does for most of us is he gets us to doubt God's intention. And he makes it not about God's intention, but about how you feel about God's intention. How many of you have ever, right before you got in trouble, had this subconscious thought, what about me? What about what I want? What about my needs? Behind every broken relationship, behind every violation, behind every crime, is a person who said, what about me? Because that's what the enemy does. I know God said, but what about what you want? I mean, don't you deserve to have a better life? Don't you deserve to have what that person has, even if it's not yours? What about me? But if you can lay hold of this truth that God is good and what God wants for you 
is more important than even what you feel that you need in that moment. Right now, we have a society and a culture that says, well, just trust your heart. That's, that's the new thing, right? Live your truth. It's your truth. Live it. Nobody can tell you how to operate your truth. You are the best judge of your life. It is, but it's fun for a season. God said through his word, he says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can even know it? But if the enemy can get me to go, you know what? I think God is keeping something from you. God is hiding something from you. He really knows that if you do this, you're going to feel more liberated than you have ever felt in your life. I can't tell you the number of friends that I've talked to that have chosen to, to walk away from God and to walk into different areas of sin in their lives, made the decision to do it. And almost without fail, they said, I've never felt more free. I've never felt more liberated. For a season, it goes on to say that they ate it and their eyes were opened because sin is fun for a season. But the end of it, guys... A pastor friend said this to me years ago, and I never forgot it. The problem with sin is it always takes you farther than you ever intended to go. There's not a single person who's addicted to any type of a substance today that on the first day said, I'm going to let this wreck my life. It was fun. There's not a single affair that began with, this is going to destroy my family. This is going to destroy my life, destroy my career. It began with, this is fun. I can handle it. But sin always takes you farther than you ever intended to go. And so God has a solution. God does this. Every problem that you have in this life, God's solution is the same. He sends his word. Psalm 107 says, And they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. What I've noticed in every situation, in most situations, when there's situations where God just steps in, you know what that's called? A miracle. All right? A miracle is when there is no fruit on the tree, there's no leaves on the tree, and God has to actually go put a fruit on it. But primarily the way God wants to operate in your life is he sends his word. You have a decision that needs to be made. Are you stuck in the thick of something right now? By God's sake, don't follow your heart. It lies. Am I the only one that's found that out? Your heart will lie to you. But God comes and he says, this is the way. Go, go here. The enemy comes in, is like, yeah, but he didn't tell you what's on the other side of that door, did he? He didn't tell you, like, what's going to, what, what's this? What, uh, every promise of God. Every promise of God. We sing the song here. All, the, all your promises are yes and amen. We're going to show that verse here in just a moment. But every promise of God is contingent upon our obedience. Because how many of you know that God was not going to violate your own will? And so he says, here's how you get out of this situation. This is what I want you to do. Listen to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, God said, So be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all the Lord God has commanded you so that you may live. How many of you want to live? And prosper. How many of you want to prosper? And prolong your days in the land. What the enemy wants to do is he wants to come in and say, yeah, but is it fun? Yeah, but, but, but what God's not telling you is that it's going to be hard and there's going to be things that you're going to have to do that you don't want to do. And he gets you to, to forget what the main point is. And what's the main point? I want to live. I want to prosper. I want to prolong your days. Listen to what he says in the New Testament. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded. God is not this eternal buzzkill who's trying to figure out how to ruin your day. In Psalm chapter 1, it paints the picture of a person who delights themselves in the Lord. When you have an opportunity, look that up. It says he will be like a tree that is planted by rivers of water whose leaves do not wither. It says whatever that person does prospers. But then Psalm chapter 2 paints a little different picture. It says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? For For the nations have gathered together and said, let us break the chains that are binding us. And when you've believed the lie that God is withholding from you, God's law feels like chains. Why should I do that? Why do I have to do that? Let's break this. But if you don't hear anything today, I want you to hear that God is good. And his plans for you are good. And his desire for you is good. 2 Corinthians says, for all the promises of God in him are yes. That's the part that we leave out, the in him. What does it mean to be in him? It means to be under his rule, to be under his authority. It means doing what God wants God's way, not because God's trying to spoil your day, but because he alone knows what is necessary for you to have your best Life. How many of you want to experience life to the full? Some of you are like going, I don't know. I'm kind of enjoying what I'm doing right now. The reality is, is whatever it is that you're doing right now, God's plans for you are far better, far greater than that. So let us hold unswervingly to the hope. What are you hoping for this morning? Or what things did you hope for that you feel that are smashed? That you feel are destroyed? Maybe it's a child that didn't turn out the way that you were hoping. Maybe it's a relationship that is struggling. Maybe it's a report from a physician who said, this doesn't look good. What are you hoping for this morning? I want to tell you not just from his word, but from my own experiences, because I have tasted and I've seen and I've experienced. God is good. Even through my best attempts to try to mess things up. There's a quote from Lisa Bevere, who's a preacher, pastor, travels around the country. She says, you may believe that you have somehow destroyed God's plan for your life but I want you to know something dear one you're not that powerful God's plans for you are yes God's plans for you are amen we sing the song here all the time it says all my life you have been faithful you want to understand the goodness of God we all know that God is able But mankind, we suffer from collective amnesia. And we remember God until the next time. And so here's your next step. I need you to remember. Go back to scripture and read the great and precious promises that God has placed for those who love him. And those that God has called according to his purpose. But then continue the story about the time that God got you out of a real sticky situation. I want to go ahead and call for our prayer counselors right now to come forward. I remember our first summer vacation here in Florida. We lived in Brooklyn, New York. And um, and, uh, we had come down to go to the Space Coast and we did the Disney thing, you know, like tourists do. And 
the last thing that we were going to do before going back to the airport is we were going to go to to see the whole Kennedy Space Center and that was like really amazing and and but now it's time to go and we all of our bags are packed in the car it was the last trip before we had to go back we got to the car only to find that the keys were still sitting in the ignition in a perfectly locked car we're from Brooklyn we lock everything and i remembered my dad kind of walking around going well god you know we got to get to this airport and as he looked down because i was right there with him neatly coiled in a circle was a wire this is back before they had electronic locks for those of you under the age of 35 neatly coiled it was as if somebody had just placed it there god was faithful i saw that as a child i remember talking with a friend of mine when i was a little older and i said to him he came by he had walked away from the lord and i said hey let's go catch a movie he said i don't have any money i said to him don't worry about it god will provide guys i wasn't trying to be spiritual i was trying to be funny what i meant was i'll pay your ticket but you ever been like so saved that you couldn't just say that he had to say something real spiritual and i said hey god will take care of it and he looked at me and he said what i'm just supposed to find a 20 dollar bill just neatly folded on the ground is that it and i looked at him and i went but he came back a couple hours later and we left i tied up all the stuff i was doing at work and we walked to the car he went to the passenger side i went to the driver's side i opened the door and i looked up and the color had drained from his face i said you okay what's the matter he said did you do this so what are you talking about i came around the side and right there between his legs was a 20 dollar bill that was neatly folded i'm sharing these stories with you because i want you to walk out of here with faith and know that god can be trusted god can be trusted i remember the doctors sharing with my mom you've got breast cancer and my mom said to them we're going to trust god now listen i'm not saying don't use doctors please hear me i'm not saying that but she felt very strongly that God had spoken to her that and the doctor said I guess we'll see you at your funeral. A year later my mom attended his funeral. That was some 30 years ago. Where are you at mom? Hey mom. Still alive and kicking. I have seen God's faithfulness. When I see this picture of my daughter standing up in the middle of Times Square. I remembered sitting across from the doctors who said she may not even be born. Just a bort. See, the promise for me wasn't one day she'll be on Times Square. The promise was God, you said you'd bless me if I chose life. And they said, "Well, she'll die." And I said, "But not by my hand." And 27 years later she's a blessing to our community. She's a blessing apparently to people in Times Square. You know, listen. But this isn't just for me, guys. This is this is for you. And I've asked the prayer counselors to come um because I want you with this knowledge of understanding that God is able. Guys, he can be trusted. I don't have to think about whether God's going to be there or not. He can be trusted. But this third area, you need to know he's for you. He is absolutely for you and I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you think you've done. You are not powerful enough to thwart God's plan for your life. I know it looks bad for some of you right now. I know you're thinking there's no way out. But God wants to speak to you through his word and he says step into it with confidence. I'll be there. 
I'll hold up my name. I won't let it fall. 